So this um, lecture uh, I developed uh, probably 10 years ago um, by the request of one of my friends. She became, I, I worked with uh, Commercial Real Estate Women, which is one of the top commercial real estate um, women organizations, professional women organizations. It's a, it's a national organization. Um, but one of my friends who is the president of the organization called me up and asked me if I would be on the board of directors. And uh, I said no because I had, was dealing with my dad. Um, but after you know, he passed away, she kept calling me up, calling me back and saying, will you be on the board? And I said yes. So I went on the board of directors and I was on the board for two years and then continued to work with the organization for another five years after that. But one of my friends who I work with she became the president-elect of the organization. And she approached me and she said, now that I'm the president-elect and I'm going to be the president next year, I was wondering if you would work with me and coach me and advise me. And I had never, you know, coached or advised somebody of that caliber. I mean, she was older than I was and very professional. And I said, yeah, I'll, I'll you know, I'll do it. But you got to give me, you know, at least a couple weeks, you know, to prepare for you know our next meeting, so I had done a lot of these. Uh, there's like seven modules. I had done some of these modules individually over the years, but I never pulled them together as a uh, comprehensive lecture. So I pulled them all together and I did the lecture for her. And I said, "Oh my God, I'm onto something here." So then what I did was um, that next semester I had about 22 students in my graduate econ course at. Golden Gate, and I decided that I would sit down with each of them for at least an hour to two hours going over all of this individually so that I could totally refine the lecture. So that when I came here to do the lecture for you guys, I knew, you know, my lecture was really, you know, the language was, was perfected. Yeah, there's seven modules to it. The first module is basically the nomenclature of knowledge. Uh, which is basically how I think, you know, the world works from a multi-institutional standpoint or multidisciplinary standpoint. I think it's actually correct. It's a social science model that I've, you know, employed in a lot of my writing and reading and teaching. Um, so I'll go over that. And it basically is the, uh, it's really the operating system of which, you know, you, you use to be able to collect and synthesize data and information for you to be able to use to make decisive decisions and know that the decisions that you're making are correct. That's really the goal of the whole thing. The second model is organizational diagnostics and organizational design. And when you're talking to people um, you know, throughout your career and building relationships, you, get, you need to know where these people came from, you know, where they grew up, you know, what schools they went to, what did they study, and where, where do they work, right? At what level of the organization or what division or function of the organization are they coming from? Because then you can adopt your language and your communication to meet the, their communication needs. And you become really efficient within your communication with those people. Plus, you want to know where you're going to go in these organizations and where you fit and then once you know that, then you can start to plan your upward mobility if that's where you want to go, okay? But you got to know who you're talking to and you got to know where you're going, okay? Um, this, the third model is uh, strategic academic and professional planning. You got to know, you got to have a plan, okay? You can't just go through life reacting to everything. You got to set up a, a strategic plan and you got to execute on it. You can always change or modify the plan, but you got to have a plan, okay? Um, and then the, uh, the fourth model is uh, psychological. Um, it's social, social psychological theory using Albert Bandura's work from Stanford University in social learning and self-efficacy. And I've, I've mentored and coached a lot of people on this. And usually one of these modules will trigger something in you because you know that one of these things is where your, I wouldn't say weaknesses are, but where you need to focus and overcome um, your uncomfortableness associated with it. And then to become extremely successful and to be able to accomplish at a very high production level um, is you need time management. Okay, You need strategic tactical operating plans. You've got to have 
weekly calendars, monthly calendars, annual calendars, and you got to basically back into all of the major dates and start hacking out time that you need to be able to achieve what you want to achieve with. I mean, one of my students today said, I want to go to grad school. I said, great, are you doing a master's or an MBA? I said, I'm going to do a master's. I got to take the G. I said, I said I, he said, I got to take the GMAT. I said, you got to be in the upper 90th percentile if you're going to get into an Ivy League school with a master's degree. And if you do the master's in finance somewhere, I would do the master's in finance. You know, go do your sports, go work for three or four years, and then uh, take that 90th percentile GPA score along with your GPA and your work experience and go to the Ivy League. Go to Harvard or MIT or something. Shoot for the, shoot for the best school. Um, so that's an example. And then if you, if you kind of adhere to all of this stuff, it's kind of a road map or at least a, a philosophy or at least, you know, your internal programming, you're going to make a lot of money, okay? Um, so the question is, is how, how do you invest your money to not lose your money, right? To get to the thousand bucks a month, you know, and three to four million dollars by the time you're 50 years old. Well, you got to know how to invest. And then at some point in time, you're going to be 70, 80 years old, sitting on multi-millions of dollars worth of assets. The question is, what are you going to do with those assets? Well, you've got to have tax and trust. Trust's in place. You need advanced planning or else you're going, to lose the, you know, you're going to lose your wealth. And people are going to steal your stuff, guaranteed. Either it's your family members or your business partners or, or the federal government, guaranteed, is going to steal your, your money. So you've got to be really smart. And if you're not... As I like to say it, you guys are just uh, sacrificial lambs that are basically going to be taken out to slaughter, okay? Because you don't have the intellectual defense to defend yourself or the ability to be able to select, you know, qualified advisors, either legal, legal accounting or, or, you know, investment advisors um, that can help guide you, you know, to, uh, to be extremely successful and be able to pr preserve and then transfer your wealth to your, uh, your family. And that's kind of what I like to focus on is, you know, can I set it up for inter intergenerational wealth transfer so that my kids and my grandkids and my great-great-grandkids and my great-great-great-great-grandkids are totally taken care of? That's kind of my goal. So can you set it up so that your family is taken care of for at least the next 100 or 200 years? Okay. Because it's, it's only going to get harder, right, over the next 200 years than, than easier. All right, so let's, I think I got it. Just got to double check. Any, you guys need to get any uh, cheesecake before we get started? No? Are you okay? Okay, so let's do it. All right, so the first model is called the nomenclature of knowledge. And this totally resonates with you guys because you're going to the university right now. We're, we're in the social science department. Okay, business is in the social science, along with anthropology and psychology and political science, and, you know, um, government relations, um, public administration. And what I found out years ago, and I developed this model in 1996, and what was interesting is when I built this model in 1996, there was no hyper-cloud computing and data centers and I mean, data processing and storage has increased a million fold, you know, since 1996. So the ability to actually build these 50 factorial 11 equa equation, regression equation, that needs to be, you know, solved simultaneously in some kind of factorial form was impossible back then. Although it, it is possible today because of the advancements, you know, in, uh, in computer technology. But the individual brain, your brain, your biological brain, is the most uh, powerful supercomputer ever designed. Your brain, on a biological basis, every single day transacts a trillion transactions per day. So theoretically, you have the most powerful supercomputer on your brain. With infinite storage, instant processing capability, you know, it's just a magnet. If you nurture it and develop it, it is an amazing machine, even more powerful than computers at this time. Computers don't even come close to the functioning, biological functioning of the human brain. So by understanding this model and basically plugging it into your operating system, that will basically allow you to not only understand how the world works, but how to forecast 
the value of equity. That is your dependent variable. The value of your equity, your family's equity, your human capital, your, your wealth, your real estate, your securities, your bond prices, your family's education, it's all human equity. It's all equity at the end of the day. And what I found out is that I couldn't just study one discipline. It was too narrow. I needed to study multiple disciplines. Because by having multiple disciplines with multiple toolboxes, I could solve more complex problems a lot quicker because I wasn't looking through it in just one disciplinary lens. I had multiple disciplines to be able to, to pull from. So the first di discipline that's the most important, or at least the foundation of everything, is your accounting. Okay? So you have to understand the managerial and the financial accounting, the financial statements, the, the being able to create budgets and tracking the budgets with the variances, you know, so you can, you can maintain control of the situation. And also have not only the non-dollar amount accounting, but also dollar accounting. So the very first thing you need to understand to run an agency or a nonprofit or a corporation or a company is you have to understand the accounting. Then the accounting rolls up into the financial statements, which becomes the finance. You take the financial statements and you show them to lenders, either in the capital markets through the stock and the bond market or through financial institutions or venture capitalists or whoever's trying to invest in your, in your company. And the finance, finance becomes the access to the capital through the capital markets or both the public or the private equity markets. To be able to raise and invest capital in the economy, you got to understand economics. you got to understand fiscal policy, i.e. taxation and appropriation. you got to understand monetary policy, money supply growth rates, open market operations, interest rate determination, yield curves, all of those things you know, come into play. And if you go overseas to other countries, you have to understand the economic ideologies in which these companies operate. Because in Europe, they're more socialistic. Here, we're neoliberal, you know, capitalism. You go to Africa or Latin America or Asia, based on their theology and culture, really determines how their businesses, you know, function within the economy and the role of businesses within the economy. So you have to understand the economic. You also have to understand political science and the policy debates, you know, based off of public priorities that are then brought to the legislature. Either the legislature can form policy, the executive branch can form policy, or people themselves, through their own agitation, can bring policy priorities to the government to basically debate, form legislation, to get that legislation passed to become law, and then those laws are administered through the bureaucracy or the public administration aspects. And those policies are going to have intended and unintended outcomes. They're going to have positive and negative externalities. And if you're one of those individuals or you're one of those demographic or psychographic groups that are actually getting hurt by these public policies, you better do something about it or you're going to get destroyed. So if you see the policies coming, then you better do something about getting out of the way or mitigating you know, the, the damage that's going to be coming your way. Uh, or what you do is you move into the positive policy outcomes and leverage those policy outcomes for you, your, your family and yourself and your, your company's benefit. Then you have to understand law and the legal system and the enforcement of private property rights. I mean, here, our system, our legal system and philosophical system, philosophy, in the legal system. If you look at the United States, we're basically modeled after Europe. You know, civil, you know, civil law, you know, European common law. We're not Napoleonic, we're not Sharia, we're you know, civil common law based on precedence, private property rights, you know, legal precedence. Um, you have different levels of court systems, municipal courts, state courts, federal courts, appeal, appeals courts, international courts. You know, they're all debating, you know, uh, these laws, and if there's no precedent, then there needs to be legal philosophy, you know, that needs to be adhered to. Perfect example is the abortion case right now from Mississippi that's going through the Supreme Court. If you listen to Amy Cohen, Cohen Barrett's and John Roberts, and, you know, basically the right wing uh, arm of the uh, of the Supreme Court, they're not even using precedents in some cases. They're using, you know, to totally absurd legal philosophies to justify their you know, articulation of, their, of the law. 
you know, that's extremely dangerous. So we have to understand the legal system. We have to understand philosophy. Um, most philosophy, the legal system, the political system, and the economic system is a derivative of theocracies that date back thousands of years. So if you really look at our system and how it's really set up, uh, there's really not much difference to theological systems that were developed five, 6,000 years ago compared to how society is basically run and managed uh, today. Uh, then you layer in the psychology and the sociology aspects of understanding how people act and react in both groups and individually on a social basis. This all pulled together becomes an extremely powerful model to be able to make investment decisions. And what holds it all together is basically our common language and linguistics, our common culture, our ability to communicate through telecommunications and technology, and probably one of the most important reflections of a civilized economy is architecture. And just look at, this is a perfect example here. I mean, imagine, this is totally bucolic, right? You are here getting an education, a beautiful campus with beautiful architecture in peace, right, that will allow you to be able to thrive going forward. There's no college in Mosul. There's no college in Baghdad. You know, there's no college in, in you know, Syria. Those, those civilizations have completely been destroyed, you know, by war. There's no education in war. So to, to understand where you are, you know, right now, you really have to appreciate, um, you really have to appreciate what you have. So that model, basically, the major takeaways there is it's basically a machine learning or a machine language. It's just like a computer it's the operating system. It basically tells you, tells you how the world works from a social science based and a complex system of institutional knowledge and equations. There's variables in one equation that are also in the other, which makes a very dynamic model. So you have collinearity. Uh, it's multi-institutional. It's a simultaneous equation solution. Uh, it's multiple regression with big data applications. And it's a biological processing with infinite storage capabilities in, with your brain. The next model is organizational di diagnostics and logistics. You guys have taken, you know, the organizational behavior class, right? Or you're taking your management class currently. And when you become a manager and start to manage organizations, um, one of the roles that you will be playing is organizational structuring. How are we going to structure our organization? Do we have to restructure the organization because of social, cultural, economic, or legal um, ramifications? Who am I talking to when I'm talking to people? Well, I'm definitely going to be talking differently to somebody who sits on the board or chairs the board. I'm going to be talking to the CEO, CFO, CEO, CMO, CTO very differently than I'm, than I'm going to be talking to a, a programmer or a systems analyst you know, or a salesperson or somebody in finance or accounting or in HR and legal, or somebody who's in production and, you know, supply chain management. So what you are basically doing by studying a business degree, which is the most awesome degree, is you're basically learning the language and the models for each individual function of the organization so you can be trilingual. You can speak to the, the accounting people in accounting language, marketing and marketing, finance and finance, the systems technology people in systems technology, language, and when you do that, there's no translation, right? A lot of people say, well, I'm a marketing major and I'm never going to do finance. Or I'm finance and I'm never going to talk to the marketing people. It's like, what are you talking about? You're going to be talking to those people all the time. Either you're, they're gonna, either you or they are going to have to translate because you, that's all you want to do is talk finance. Or if you're bilingual in marketing and finance, I can talk to the marketing people in their language and basically have a 20-minute conversation with them to get everything done to then move on as opposed to a two-hour conversation because everybody's translating into their own language. I've worked with CTOs, CFOs, CMOs. I've worked with these people before. I can talk to them at their level and I can get stuff done in 20 minutes that otherwise would take two hours or two days 
or two weeks. We can shorten the process and, and know that the, the solution that we came up with was correct. So the organization, and this, this is probably review for you guys, is broken up into the mechanistic and organic forms of the organization. The organic form of the organization is basically team-based and virtual. You're working in cross-functional teams across different functions of the organizations, working on projects, and then you go, once you've completed one project, you go to the next one. Unless you become the sponsor of the project or the program, that then becomes a new division within the company. Hopefully you become the divisional manager if that's what you want to do. Some people like to stay down here in this organic virtual realm because it's very frenetic. They can work across different functions with different people. They love the project-based you know, aspects associated as opposed to the functional-based aspects. So then once you get into the organization, depending on the size of the matrix form of the organization, you plot out, okay, well, I'm here, right? Um, and if I want to move up in the organization, I got to move from here to here to here, you know, to get, maybe, I'll, maybe I got to go from here over to here, up to here, over to there, up to here, over to here, you got to be here, right? So you got to be constantly, you know, plotting the logistics through the organizational structure, depending on how far you want to go you know, in your career. But I'm going to talk differently to the board of directors than I do to the systems programmers down here. So one, you've got to know where you are, where you're going to go, and if you run into any glass ceilings within these organizations, and I don't know, there could be glass ceilings in organizations based on politics or groupthink or maybe race or gender or, you know, education or whatever. People are always putting up, you know, barriers to your Ability. If you get stuck in any one of these positions that looks like it's going towards a dead end, you better get the hell out of there because if you don't, you're basically wasting your time and actually your human capital value is actually deteriorating very quickly. So that's when you pop out and go find another position in another company to then leverage your human capital, okay, and the stuff that you learn within the organization. Um, so basically the major takeaways from this is, first thing you do is you scan the organizational structure of the company. Okay? Learn about how it's structured, what's the functions, who are the divisional heads, who are the people, look up their backgrounds on LinkedIn, find out where they grew up, where they went to school, what their hobbies are, learn all of that stuff because you've got to be able to build the relationships with these people. You've got to understand organizational design based on industry and what the comparative advantages and disadvantages are of the company because they're going to be looking to you saying, well, what do you think we should do? You know, should we break up this division? Should we consolidate the division? Should we eliminate the position? What do you think? They're going to be asking you these, these questions. you got to determine your location uh, within the organization and you got to be able to um, you got to be able to understand and articulate, this is the key part, you got to be constantly able to articulate the value that you bring to that position within the division, within the organization, constantly. Okay, that's reflected in your resume, obviously, but you got to be able to communicate it to people instantaneously when you meet them. Okay, and I can't tell you how many jobs I've gotten, you know, uh, at social events where I'm talking to people and before you know it, they're calling me up saying, you know what, we were, we were talking to you, uh, we really like, you know, what you said, um, uh, would you come uh, do what you talked about, you know, in my company, okay? So you never know where the opportunities can go. So you have to understand how to navigate, how to arbitrage your human capital, how to build and accumulate experience. And if you can't get the if you can't build and accumulate your experience, your human capital, and your human equity within the company, and this has happened to me before, because they're not going to just give you what you want, you got to work for it, but I'm impatient. Uh, I said, fine, I will stay with your organization for five to seven years, but while I'm doing it, you need to pay for the master's degrees, because I want to continue getting my MS and information systems, finance and MBA, so that I can do a dual track so I'm getting, you know, really leveraging my human capital. Um, and if, if they won't give it to me, I'll get it myself. Uh, you've got to be willing to move, and you've got to be willing to execute. Okay? No fear. If it's not working, you're gone. Okay? You're out of there. Because you, you're, you're wasting your time. Okay? 
And if somebody brings an opportunity to you and it looks good and you've weighed it and it looks like the right decision, you make the decisive decision, you get out of there and give you two weeks. Notice in your gone. Uh, you got to be able to communicate uh, vertically and hor horizontally within the organization, and you got to be ready to go at all times. Boom, you're gone. And it's different. You know, before we used to um, say, well, you got to be with the organization for five years and stuff like that. The way I did it was I went to a company for one year, then I went three years to another company, stayed at the other company for five years, I stayed at the other company for seven. So, you know, once you start building a track record, right, around your, your experience, you can then leverage it, okay? And it's different now, especially now with uh, labor shortages, uh, because people are retiring, people are dropping out of school, people are, you know, they can't get enough talent. Now's like the perfect environment, you know, to be, to be looking and getting, getting a really good job. Okay. But I would get a job as soon as possible. Okay. Don't, don't wait. The next model is the uh, professional and academic strategic plan. Okay. You got to have a strategic plan. This is the plan that I came up with um, uh, for my friends and my students. And this is, this is basically how it's structured. So down here, you basically have all of your priorities. And some of you are all, actually a lot of you are doing this already. There's certain things that you're willing to sacrifice. There's certain things that you're not willing to sacrifice. So you got to be willing to take, you know, the consequences associated with your decisions and your priorities. But if you're going to be moving up, you know, in some kind of managing director, EVP, VP, you know, executive position, you're going to have to start making some sacrifices at some point, either personal or family or some kind of, Sacrifices again, they're not going to just give it to anybody. So the first thing you got to do is to figure out what your priorities are. You know, is it school? Is it your job? Is it music? Is it sports? Is it your friends? Is it your family? What is it? What are you willing to give up? And what are you not willing to give up? Give up? And what you're what you're not willing to give up? You, are you willing to take the consequences associated? You know, the costs associated with not be, being willing. And one of the things that all of this takes, takes up is time, right? So time is your commodity. Time is what's valued. If you can optimize your time or create time, then you now have more resources to be able to do stuff. So understanding that the first thing that you have to accomplish is your bachelor's degree. Because you ain't going anywhere. Or maybe these days if you do boot camp, coding camps or whatever, and some people are just innate, they just they can't stay in school and they just want to go right into work. Um, you got to have the bachelor's degree as the ticket to get into the baseball game or the basketball game, right? Because the goal is not to get into the game. The goal is to be on the field, right, and being a professional. But you can't get in the game without the ticket, right? So the ticket is your bachelor's degree. And that can take, you know, between four and seven years to, to get your bachelor's degree. It took me seven, you know, just to get the first two years and took me another seven to get the bachelor's degree because I was working and playing sports and doing stuff. But once you get the bachelor's degree and you've graduated, that three to five to seven year period in here is like this bardo state where you're accumulating experience, certifications, credentials. Now you can, like my student, you know, get your CPA if you're an accounting major. You know, maybe you do the first two years to get the CPA. Um, then you do the next three years to get your CFA, right? So you walk out after five years with your CFA and your CPA. I mean, you're badass, right? Because those are two of the hardest uh, certifications that you can get out there. Maybe you get your real estate broker's license, your insurance license. You know, you get your PMP certification to, to do product and project management. Maybe you get MS Office or Salesforce or whatever it is. You're just accumulating the certifications, licensing, credentials along with your work experience. And then two years, two years in, it's like, I'm ready to go. I'm going Ivy League, okay? So I got to start planning and plotting, you know, to get into Berkeley or Stanford or Harvard or USC or UCLA or wherever you want to go. Because you're going to need the letters of recommendation. You're going to need statement of purpose, you got to get your, your grades. If you don't have the grades, you got to go back and re 
mediate, take courses over again, you know, to be able to show them that you have the aptitude you know, to go to a really good MBA program. And you got to be in the 90th percentile on your GMAT score. And if you're going PhD, you got to be in the 90th on your GRE. If you're going to law school, you got to be in the 90th percentile on your LSATs. And if you do get really good grades on those, um, you can get into better schools or if you're going to PhD or law degree, they're going to give you more money to go to law school or go get your PhD. Um, so, it, you know, they actually pay you. Um, so you get into the program, you're already in, you can start networking, you know, with everybody, the alumni and the university. So now you're tapped into the network. And then you go in and you go pound out two years. And it's not even two years, it's four semesters, right? Because you have a month off during the, the winter break and then you have the, uh, the summer off. And most people, what they'll do is within the first year, they've already got their summer internship set up in the corporate finance or at PA at some major corporation, maybe it's Wall Street or they're doing marketing at Salesforce or some high tech firm in the Valley or some VC or private equity or whatever. Um, so they go do their internship and usually nine times out of 10, the company that they uh, sponsored their internship offers them a job. And not only offers them a job, but offers to take out the rest of their, their, their debt and to pay off the rest of their education. So it wasn't even the cost of the education was the issue, it was getting into a really good school. So the cost of the education is not even an issue, right? Because you're gonna negotiate having somebody take it out for you at some point. So the only thing that matters is making sure that currently in this program, you stay on track and you focus on your grades and you get really good letters of recommendations from your academicians or your professors. Once you've gotten through the program, you already got your job, you're in this associate apprentice level. That could last maybe three to five years, and you're going to be underneath some executive vice president, vice president, or managing director, or something. The reason why you want to be under one of these people is these people are highly mobile. These people want to be a CEO, right? They're trying to jockey for the top slot. And if you're the second in line, when they blow out, you pop up and you take their position. Bam. Um, you get it. It's pretty freaking amazing. And then some people like to stay here at this mid-market level. This is kind of where I am. I like to be tactical, where I work with, you know, basically the operating units in between the strategic planners and, and you know, senior level managers and the board. I'm kind of in here. I'm kind of the execution person that works between the two and gets stuff done, okay? Um, and then these people up here, when you reach the C-suite, that's like another 10 to 20 years. So if you add up everything up, you know, here's four years, you know, here's seven years. So that's almost, you know, what, 10? And then you got another five years, that's 15, there's 20, there's 30, 40 years right there. All righty, gone, bam. And here's the thing that's, that's amazing, is if you put your career in a 30, 40 year context and got your plan in place, the time's going to go like that, trust me. And here's the saddest part of this whole story, is you guys right now, you know, if you execute on a lot of the stuff right now and really set yourself up, you guys are going to be multimillionaires, guaranteed. Okay, even if you don't even try, you're still going to be multimillionaires. Okay, but the sad part about this whole thing that always upsets me is that you guys do not have life insurance, and your family got you here over the last 20 years and invested huge amounts of their effort, time, and money to get you here. And if you asked any of your parents, they would tell you that they were relying on you to a certain degree to help take care of them um, when they get old, okay? But if you're not around and you didn't get life insurance and gave them the million dollars that they would need to be, you know, live comfortably in a home because you got hit by a car, shot, Crohn's, diabetes, cancer, whatever it is, and you don't make it, they get nothing. Now, I got nobody in my 20s. I used to have a million dollars worth of life insurance for 30 years when I was 20 years old because I knew anything could happen to me at any time. And if something happened to me, I wanted to make sure my family got a million bucks. And you know how much a million dollars of life insurance costs per year for 30 years for somebody in their 20s? Can you guess? How much would it cost yearly? Six fifty a year. Yeah, six hundred fifty bucks. Yeah, 
That's that's less than your beer budget. So why don't you why don't you guys do it? Oh, I have, don't have any children. I'm healthy. You know, I don't. You know, I really, I'm not worried about it. Oh, I could take the 650 bucks, you know, a year and put that in the stock market and make a million. That's not the case. Some point in time, if you get the insurance now, while you're young and healthy, and if you do um, contract some kind of you know, terminal or some kind of chronic disease, they could never take that insurance away from you. You have it for 30 years until you're 50. So you get insurance until you're uninsurable. And make sure that you, you have it. Because I'll tell you later, Professor Souza, I don't believe in life insurance, really? Well, why don't you talk to all the rich people on the East Coast and everybody down in Silicon Valley, because they have a ton of it. So obviously you must be smarter than they are. Right? Or you have better advanced planning people in your, you know, that you're talking to, because everybody I've talked to in my career as an advanced planner uses insurance as an integral part of their risk and investment management strategies. So either you know something I don't, or I know something you don't. It's probably, that's probably the case. All right. So again, don't worry about the money for the program. Save your money. Get grants and scholarships. Get it from your parents if you can. Ask from, your, ask from your employer to pay for it. If they won't, ask them if they'll use your bonus money to pay for the education pre-tax. Set up a corporation. Run the expense of the MBA from Berkeley through your C Corp and pay for it pre-tax as a bonus to you as part of your corporation, as an executive in the corporation. And then the worst case scenario, use bank financing. So it's not even a financing issue. It's just, it's. Do you realize, do you want to go to the top, okay? Do you want to go there? Um, so the major takeaway here is 20 to 30 years goes by really fast. Um, you need to plan and you need to stay on track, okay? Uh, do not worry about the money. Uh, shoot for the best school in the program uh, and don't let anybody get in your way. Now, when I was articulating what I wanted to do, to my friends, what do you want to do, Larry? Why are you getting all these master's degrees and you know studying all that stuff? I hated school. Well, I wanted to be a financial engineer working for a large hedge fund or private equity company or an investment bank. I wanted to design you know investment strategies around indexation and property derivatives, you know, to be able to create product in the capital markets and be a financial engineer. Do you know what they told me? You know what they said to me? I don't even know what you're talking about. Let's go have a cocktail, right? They had, they had no clue. And most of the times they didn't even care. And they were projecting their psychology onto me, trying to sabotage me for some weird psychological reason on their part. So it's like what I decided to do is I would just tell people what they wanted to hear and move on because I really didn't care. So they, when they started you know, giving me a hard time, it's like, yeah, I like school. Little did they know that I planned it all out over time and I knew exactly what I was doing and I knew it was going to take me 15 to 20 years to do what I wanted to do. And I needed multiple master's degree and different levels of education to do what I wanted to do. But nobody was going to show me how to do it and nobody really cared. Okay. Until I did it and then they were interested. It's like, how'd you do it? And, and I, you know, I can't talk in sound bites to people. Okay. Most people have an attention span probably 20 seconds. So if anybody gets in front, of, in front of you, go through them, go around them, always make sure that you're going forward you know, in your career. Do not wait for anybody. And if there's anybody that is getting in your way for your success, just tell them what they want to hear and get them out of the way. Because you can't, you can't explain anything to those people because they, they can only hear themselves talking. The best is to find people that are unconditionally um, your friends or family members or people that love you because they're going to believe in you unconditionally. Those are the people you want around you. Those are the people you want. Get rid of everybody else. You're wasting your time. All right. So the next model is social learning and uh, modeling. Albert Bandura just passed away. Stanford University, I can't believe he didn't get the Nobel Prize, but he should have gotten the Nobel Prize because he is probably one of the most prolific, you know, uh, psychologists out there 
uh, not only from an applied standpoint, but also theoretical. His, his theories are, you know, based on B.F. Skinner, you know, um, you know, and, and other behavioral uh, psychologists. And what was brilliant about Bandura's work, and he, he was at Stanford, and he was doing these clinical studies. And what he did, which was so brilliant, he did what was the uh, Bobo Clown study. I don't know if you guys have heard about this one. And there was two studies that they did. Um, the first one was they had an experimental group and a control group. They put a bunch of kids, you know, in each of the rooms with a television set, okay? And the kids were um, watching TV. And this, is, this actually shows how powerful social media is and computer games and, and, you know, all the stuff that we do on our computers, particularly, you know, media, television, and uh, gaming. In, in the control group, they were watching um, uh, Bobo the Clown uh, uh, shows um, where the kids were playing with Bobo on television. You know, they loved him. You know, he was, he was a great guy. He was just like, he was just a great situation. And the other one, they were showing images of Bobo getting beaten up, you know, by people and by kids and stuff like that. Um, and when they, 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 took the two control, the, the control and the experimental group, put them in a room and had a clown come in. You know, the control group, all the kids ran up to the clown and was hugging the clown and stuff like that. Uh, when they brought it into the experimental group, everybody came in and started beating up on the clown. Okay. So basically, what, what we do as human beings, which I don't know if you know or not, but basically you model other people's behaviors. You model up other people's languages. It's either your parents or your uncles or your friends. Your friends are probably the worst people to model in some cases because they're of your age. But if they're really good people with, that are really smart, articulate, compassionate, you know, have all of the positive attributes that you want to emulate and model, that's awesome. But we, right, unfortunately as human beings, particularly in the developmental stages of our upbringing, if you're not lucky enough to grow up in a good family environment or social environment, I mean, just imagine these kids, you know, that are growing up in abject poverty where they're, you know, living in extreme cases of social pathologies, you know, and criminality and, you know, abnormal behavior. That's awful. I mean, what is the probability of being able to work yourself out of that situation without being affected by that psychology in itself? Again, we are so freaking lucky. But Bandura, you know, realized this uh, through his work. And then what he, what he did do, too, is he did another study um, of uh, security guards at prisons um, and found out that security guards at prisons, if le left in isolation, would degrade into like an Abu Ghraib type of situation where they resort to torture and inhuman behaviors. It's just really sick. So. Uh, but it just goes to show the power of modeling, you know, you know, in, in our psychology. So what I did was I took Bandera's work and I modified it for you guys. So what I realized is that here you are right now. This is your actual self. Okay, this is where we are right now, right? You know, I'm in college. I'm a sophomore, junior, might be a senior. You know, I don't want to be going to school. I want a career. I want to be out there doing stuff. I want to be, you know, in my career. So here's where we are and here's where you want to be. Right? So this is your actual self. Here's your ideal self, which when you start to work on your ideal self and actually know what you want to be, um, you create a target self. So something that you're actually shooting for on a daily basis through your own psychology. Well, that target self, in my view, is made up. You can't just have like one person. I mean, I love my mom. She's totally awesome. She's compassionate. She's the nicest person in the world. But she's not a successful businesswoman. You know, that's somebody that I can model based on what they did to become successful. She's got a lot of really positive attributes that I emulated and modeled. Um, but I need other models that I can find that have the attributes that I want to emulate to so I can target that to become my ideal self. Now, the problem is, is there is a gap between your actual self and your ideal self. That's called cognitive dissonance. So the question, there's a lot of stress there. Because what you're trying to do on a constant basis is narrow this gap 
to become your ideal target self. How do you do it? You do it through the process of self-efficacy. Okay, the process of self-efficacy. And the process of self-efficacy is used all the time, you know, in sports. I mean, you guys know, understand sports psychology. You know exactly what your ideal sports configuration is. You know where you are and you work on it constantly through the self-efficacy process. And do you fail? Yes, you constantly fail. But why do you fail? And this is the key. You don't fail because you have a genetic predisposition. You fail because you don't have enough information. You haven't tried enough. You don't have the persistence and perseverance to keep going to learn how to overcome to learn through the self-efficacy process to close the cognitive dissonance gap. Bam. Okay. And what I think is really, really interesting is that I, I run into two types of students, mostly, in the extremes. Professor Souza, I'm a you know sales person, people person, you know, I'm a manager. You know, I love people, I want to work with people. Hey, my parents were, you know, in sales and management and marketing. They, you know, were extremely successful. You know, they're a people person. I'm a people person. I'm going to go into sales management and marketing because I'm a people person. It's like, um, and I can't do math. I'm not good at math. I'm not good at the program. You know, I like the program. I don't like the mathematics. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stay over here on the sales side and the people side. I know I can be successful over there and that's what I'm going to do. And then I got the people on the other side that are like, oh, no, I can't deal with people. It's like, you know, I'd rather just be a coder, you know, and do stuff in the back and, you know, work in computers and stuff like that, or the science and the math side. Um, you know, my parents were scientists and mathematicians. You know, they did really good. They were truly successful. I have a genetic predisposition to, to math and science. I'm not going to do the sales and the marketing and the people side. I'm going to just stay over here. And that's it. But the, the person that I think is the true person that becomes uh, the senior executives at these organizations totally understand what side they came into, either through some kind of comparative advantage or some kind of psychology, you know, because their parents were in one way or other areas. But they realize where their weaknesses are and they focus on their weaknesses. And they become a hybrid individual that's good at both. And that takes time. You've got to go through the self-efficacy process to do that. If you can do all of this, it's pretty awesome. Because this is what happens to you if you get to here. One, when you walk into a room, you have the persona. Okay? You have the personality. You have the personality and the persona that gravitates people to you. Uh, because you have the personality. And since you have the command of the articulation and communication, you've got the presence. It's leveraged with the dress. Obviously, I'm not very good at that. Um, but again, if you see these people as they move up, their dress is the first thing they see, right? That they see of you. Even before you say anything, they're checking you out, right? Uh, so your dress is, is really important. And then your command of your language and your communication, if you can be extremely precise in your communication and your, 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 your language, they're going to totally respect you like that, okay? Because you have the referent power, the expertise power to be able to get them drawn to you, to respect you, because you have the charisma. Once you have the charisma, you can be a leader and you can take on leadership roles. Uh, you will then have the power of persuasion to be able to get people to do what you need them to do because people are not motivated just by money. They're motivated by love and respect. And if, if they love and respect you, they're going to work for you, okay? No matter how much money you pay them. Obviously, if you pay them enough. But here's the key, here's the key to the whole thing. And a lot of you are probably already there, but you probably don't realize it. Um, once you have all of this, you become a model for other individuals. And people will come to you and want you to take them with you in your success. And then you have two, de two decisions to make. Either you take them or you don't. Now that's really amazing to have that much power to be able to help people succeed in their, in their lives. Um, that's an amazing, powerful situation. That's one of the reasons why I've taught for so long. 
The other is that at some point in time, you may have to make a decision to leave people behind because of their own pathologies or psychoses or neuroses or you know, other types of behavior that you're not willing to basically put your reputation down on the line for those people because of some of their bad behavior. So you're gonna have to leave those people behind and they could be your family and your friends, unfortunately. So really, really tough uh, decisions. All right, so that's that module. Um, the next one, to be able to do all of this stuff, you gotta be a super uber planner. You gotta be you know, a, a master of time management. The first thing you need to do, and this is what I did, is I basically put to, together a five-year strategic plan and basically laid out all of the priorities that I wanted to accomplish in each one of the five years, ranked from high priority to low priority. Okay? So it totally clearly allows you to identify what your goals and objectives are that you're working towards. You know, what do you want to do? And then every year you basically update, so it's a rolling five-year strategic plan that you're building for yourself. And what I would do is I wouldn't get too hung up, you know, on the priority to where it's like, I got to get this done by this year. If you can't get it done by this year because the certain situations have come up, then you push it out to another year or further out into the future where you push it down and bring another priority up. So it's very fluid. But I'll tell you, I've laid these plans out and I've accomplished stuff that I had on my list Three years, 30 years later, I don't care it took me 30 years to do it, to get there, where I wanted to be. I don't care if it took me 30 years. That's all that matters is I got there. I did it. Because I don't want to, you know, at some point in time in my life, sit there or lay there and say, God, I really wish I would have done it. You know, that's the worst. Because it's going to drive you insane doing it. And then you take your tactical planning where you take the first three years, you break it up into at six months in increments where you break them up into quarters, and you start setting up some more narrow goals and objectives that are achievable, you know, more operational objectives that you can start checking off your, your checklist. Uh, again, if you do that, you're, you are going to be extremely productive in what you do. And they used to ask me all the time, how did you do it? You know, how did you get... You know, two undergrads, five masters, a doctorate degree, work full time and teach. You know, along with everything else, playing rugby and doing all that. How did you do it? I was totally organized. Okay, I had to be. And then you got your annual plan. This is totally awesome because we're you know getting ready to go into January. You start plotting out the key milestone dates and start hacking out periods. You know, prior to these dates, so that you can hit these dates. You know, and achieve your goals and objectives. So you have to start mapping out what you're willing to sacrifice and what your allocation of time is going to be. And then I love the weekly planner. Like if you look at my schedule, I'm totally booked for two weeks in advance. It drives my wife freaking crazy. It's like, oh, I want to go to Calistoga this weekend. No. So it's like, yeah, if you, I'll give you, you know, maybe in three weeks from now or a month from now, but not in the next two weeks. And then she's like going, well, you better, you know, the, in the next three, to, you better have those two weeks, you know, booked for me because, you know, I'm giving you the next two weeks. So I got the next two weeks to, to mess around. So this is kind of how I look at it. Between 5 and 8 in the morning, I mean, you're probably you know, getting to your job. Maybe you're working out. Maybe you're working on your homework. Or maybe you're doing studying for, you know, licensing or something like that. So you basically have 5 to 8 in the morning. You usually uh, get to your job. You work from 9 to 12, and you got 12 to 1 off, right, or 1 to 2, whatever it is, for your lunch break. You can do whatever you want during that time period. Then you come back and you work from 1 to 5. And then you go somewhere to get somewhere. It takes an hour, maybe two hours to get there. And then you got until basically 11 or 12. I don't know. I can't stay up until 2 and get up at 5 anymore. Um, but that's kind of the areas of time that you have available to you. So, Professor Susan, I don't have enough time. Well, you're not organized, obviously. You know, you haven't identified, you know, your open time periods to be able to slot people and events into, and you haven't blocked out the key time periods that you need to study for your exams or 
you know, work on your whatever it is, you know, for your work or something, you don't have this all blocked out two weeks, you know, three weeks a month in advance. That's why when I get my, get my class schedule, I start, I go through my calendar, I start blocking out all the time so I can see where my open times are and where my free time is. You know, where my block time is, my free time. And I just start booking stuff in there and start crossing out time for me so that people don't come to me and say, hey, can you do this? It's like, well, when do you want me to do it? Oh, next, well, I can't do it, you know, that day. I already got something going on. Uh, but I can do it this, this, or this date. So you just kind of work around the, the schedules. Okay. So if you've done all of this so far, you're in your career, you're accumulating money, you're making a good salary, you're starting to save, starting to invest, starting to plan, maybe for a family or not, whatever your priorities are. And if you're really good, if you're really, really good, uh, and you guys should be doing this now, and I think I talked about this before, you got to have start having these conversations with your parents. Okay, where's the money? Okay, who's on the bank accounts? Who's on the life insurance policy? Who's on the deeds? Okay, where's the money? Am I going to get any of it? Okay, if they say, yeah, 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 you'll get it, but I don't want to show you the information, you're not going to get it. Okay, um, because you got to, you guys are emancipated. You're adults now. You got to know where the money is. And all the best families that I've worked with, all of their kids of your age are already in the plan. They've been in the plan for a long time. They already brought them in because they're starting to transfer the assets. And they want to make sure if any, anything happens to them or their grandparents that everything transfers smoothly and is not caught up in some kind of legal or institutional morass because they can't get to the counts because your parents and your grandparents didn't think about it. Okay. So what do you ask everybody? Uh, you, you ask them, um, uh, what are your retirement objectives and what is the transfer of the assets going to look like? Do you guys have a will in place? Do you have a will with a medical directive in it? Who's in the, who are the beneficiaries of the will? Do you have a living trust? Who are the beneficiaries of the trust? Uh, who are, who's on the deed to the, uh, to the real estate assets? Uh, who is the beneficiaries of the life insurance policies? Who's on the bank accounts? Uh, do you have, um, uh, do you also have guardianship and other types of uh, legal documents in place of something that happens, it's going to transfer to you so you can get access to the money because your father had a stroke and your mother's been dead for three years. So who's going to take care of, you know, who's going to take care of your parent? Well, you are. Well, if you don't have guardianship and you don't have the paperwork, you can't get to the money and it's going to be hard to get them into a home. Okay, so there's all these administrative things that you need to do now, okay, to get it done, okay? And if your sister's already done it, then that's great because she's going to get everything, right? Um, so you've got to be part of the conversations. It's really hard to have these conversations, but this stuff happens. And when it happens, if you are, have everything in, in order, it's going to go smoothly. If you don't, it's going to be a nightmare because you and your siblings are going to be arguing over the estate. And they probably, nine times out of ten, the family's going to be destroyed. Okay? Because it's all about the money at that point. Screw the relationship. I want the two million dollars. Okay? All right. So, this is how we do it. So, what you're going to do is you're going to be setting up, you know, these uh, 401k programs at your companies. Your company's going to set up a 401k, which is called a qualified account. And if you're lucky, they're going to match your retirement. So you're going to contribute into the 401k plan. And if they match you, it's awesome. It's like free money. Okay? And that money is going into what is called a qualified account. And uh, it's pre-tax. And it allows you to defer the taxes until you pull the money out. Okay? So the money will accumulate tax deferred. And when you reach 59 and a half, you can start pulling money out uh, penalty free. So uh, when you're under 59 and a half, you have all this money in this qualified account. If you pull the money out, you're going to pay the capital gains tax, the income tax, and a penalty of 10%. Okay? So it's, there, there's all kinds of uh, taxes. Some people do uh, SEP IRAs where they'll uh, pay them, pay, sorry, Roth RIAs, uh, where basically they pay the taxes up front, they never have to pay the taxes again. 
The SEP IRA is for businesses, um, and you can actually do defined benefit programs. The defined benefit programs are awesome. SEP, I think I can co contribute maybe for my business like 52,000 bucks a year into it. But let's say I did a, a, a bunch of real estate deals and I made a million bucks. Um, and I you know, paid the taxes, so I got 500 grand in my pocket. But I got 250 grand still sitting in the corporation. I can set up a defined benefit program and slam 250,000 bucks in there per year, tax deferred. So it's awesome. You do that for eight years, you get a couple million bucks in there. But the problem is, is that when you turn 70 and a half, the IRS is going to show up at your doorstep and they're going to cause you to take a mandatory required minimum distributions. So they'll basically take your wealth, divide it by 30, and force you to take your money so that you can pay the taxes that you deferred over the, you know, your, your retirement period. Then at some point in time, you maxed out on that because you don't want to put too much money <coughs> in these qualified accounts because as you start taking these RMDs, if you overfunded it, it's going to push you into a higher tax bracket, and you're going to have to take the uh, alternative minimum tax, um, and you could be looking at 70% tax rate, you know, on your money. So you're basically limited, and at some point in time, you make too much money to, to contribute to your retirement account. So the IRS forces you into the non-qualified or the after-tax realm. So now where are you going to put your money? Well, you can put it in cash, you can put it in stocks, you can put it in real estate, you can invest in businesses, and then take a bunch of your depreciation allowances and all kinds of stuff, you know, that the IRS lets you charge off or amortize or depreciate to lower your um, taxable income. And then at some point in time, you've maxed out the allocation here, um, your real estate, your businesses, your stocks, portfolios may shoot up in value, and now you're completely overweighted in this non-qualified after-tax realm, that's when you start liquidating some of your assets and start investing in muni bonds, cash value life insurance, guaranteed annuities, um, those things to basically create an annuity stream. So you were aggressive pre-tax, aggressive after-tax, then to become in the safe route to build the annuity so that you can live out the rest of your days at a very high standard of living and not burden your uh, your kids. So the tools to accumulate, and this is where I have debates with my students because they're obviously smarter than I am, <coughs> is there's risk and investment management. Okay, So underneath the risk management arm, prudent applications of insurance. And insurance is not only, not just insurance, it's financial products. Okay, so they're tools. Um, they could be hybrids, so they look and smell like insurance, but they're really investments. Okay, but you can't get access to them unless you're health, healthy. Once you something happens to you, boom, all that stuff is off the table and you're stuck over here. So that's why you want to get that stuff done as soon as possible. My recommendation: you get the convertible term insurance policy, a million bucks, 20 years. You know, New York Life, Northwestern, some kind of good mutual insurance company. A million bucks, um, you're paying, I don't know, a thousand bucks a year, or whatever. And then but what it allows you to do is at some point in time you can convert the term policy into a whole life policy. So it goes from a thousand bucks a year to twenty thousand bucks a year. But when I pay the twenty thousand bucks a year in premium, it's going towards a permanent cash value whole life insurance that accumulates cash value, tax free. And I could borrow on the cash value if I want to buy a car or send Johnny to college or put a down payment on a house. I'm basically am borrowing from myself and paying my policy back. Uh, if I pass away, this becomes permanent insurance too. So if I get, if I fully pay up, I convert it, I fully pay up my million, my million dollar whole life insurance policy, the insurance company is guaranteed to pay out a million dollars to your beneficiaries. Or you can draw down the cash value in the policy and live off it as an annuity in your retirement if you want to. So it's pretty cool. And if you die, 
and the money goes to the beneficiaries and the money that they receive is underneath the estate tax ceiling, they get the death benefit tax free. Tax free, tax free, tax free. That's why people use whole life insurance because of the tax free nature of it. Okay, it's an investment decision. Okay, I can use variable universal life where I'm basically taking the premiums and it's invested in the stock market. Um, I can also invest in long term care and actually deduct the premiums through my C corporation. So me and my wife have long-term care premiums being paid by the corporation pre-tax. So if I can't do two monthly functions per day and I go into a home, the long-term care policy will kick in and basically the, the benefits will pay for my congregate care. Okay? So long-term care is important. You guys will be getting disability insurance on yourself, and if you go to a company and you're in the top ranks, they're going to slap life insurance on you. Okay? And if you go to companies, because I'm so smart, i got a tech company and a startup, and we're going to make billions of dollars, great, Johnny. Um, the company's going to want a $5 million policy on you. Uh, because if you die with your IP, we're out the $5 million that we gave you to start your company. So we want to make sure that we get our money back. If you blow out from whatever escapades you were doing. Um, if you're going to own real estate, you need property casualty insurance. Because if you underinsure your property to torches in one of these fires, you're going to have to come up with the extra money uh, to basically rebuild the property um, to replace uh, the improvement and bring it back online to generate uh, income. And if you're successful and you're running a business, guaranteed people are going to come after you and try to get you to do, to do something because of product liability or you know, trip and fall on your apartment building, they're going to try to sue you and get as much money out of you as possible. And you're going to need to fly in the women from Chicago and New York, the badass attorneys, the business umbrella insurance and the property casualty stuff, they're going to fly in, they're going to take the red eye out here, they're going to go to court, they're going to settle the thing, and they're going to get back on the plane in two hours and leave. Okay? Totally protecting you from your from getting your stuff um, stolen. You're going to invest in 401ks. When you leave the company, you're going to roll that money over into a self-directed IRA. Okay? Hire, and hire somebody better than me uh, to basically oversee your portfolio and give you really good investment advice. Um, they're probably going to be invested in mutual funds you know, or exchange traded funds. Um, you could also take your IRA money and invest in real estate now too through a company like Pensco will do all the um, all the qualified accounting around that so you can do that too. Um, some people will basically roll some of that money into a variable annuity okay and what they'll do is they'll get I love this this rider it's the guaranteed investment protection rider totally freaking awesome I take a million bucks I roll it over into a variable annuity with a guaranteed investment protection rider. They say, well, you know, you're going to have to pay 1% you know, fee you know, per year on the asset center management for that guaranteed investment protection rider. Fine. Because I gave them a, mil a million bucks. What it basically allows me to do is for 1%, I can basically get a seven year put option. So I gave them a million bucks. Within two years, the market corrects over 35%. I lost 35% of my million bucks. But since I got the guaranteed investment protection rider, the insurance company writes me a check to basically make me whole again. So I don't lose any of the principal. And what I do is over time, I basically let the, uh, the portfolio accumulate. I lift the floor, lock in my wealth. Do it again, lift the floor, lock in my wealth. So basically I have a long put option uh, that basically guarantees that I don't lose any of my wealth. Uh, people, people love these things because after the financial crisis people lost like 50% of their retirement income and had to work for the next 10 years because they were going to retire in 2009. But since they lost 30 to 40% of their portfolio they had to stay working for the next 10 years. Uh, the other one that I like is the guaranteed future income annuity. I give the, uh, I give the insurance company a million bucks, I'm 50 years old. I said, I want to start taking, you know, I want to get a payment. But when I'm 70, okay, Mr. Souza, we're going to give you 10% of the million, so we're going to give you 
$100,000 a year um, for basically the rest of your life. Okay? So I gave them the money, they used it for 20 years, and in exchange I get a guaranteed payout of $100,000, sorry, $100,000 on the million every single year for the rest of my life. So I never run out of money. And if I get a joint with my wife, if I pass away, she gets the hundred grand for the rest of her life. Okay, so there's a sort of survivorship thing there. And then the last is the fixed annuities. Okay, I'm 80 years old. I'm not taking any market risk. I just need money to live off until I die. Okay. Um, then, at some point, this is all taken care of. This is all taken care of. Now I'm in the non-qualified side. I'm in investing in businesses and real estate, stock brokerage accounts. This is all after tax. In most cases, I can sell off the assets, but I'm going to have to pay, you know, capital gains. And if it's real estate, I got to pay capital gains and the recapture tax and Obamacare. I can also invest in these variable annuities here, and this is where the rich people love this stuff because they can take this after-tax money, and there's no limit to the amount of money that they can put in these tax-deferred annuities. And it's asset protected, so if somebody tries to sue me and steal my money, um, they can't get, they can't pierce the the annuity now, so it's protected. And if I die, it transfers very efficiently to my, my heirs and my beneficiaries. I can also put money in these future income annuities, and I actually kind of like this one too, because I'm paying taxes on the payouts over here. Over here, a third of the payout is tax-free, because I used after-tax money to, uh, to buy the annuity, and the IRS says I can get a return basis at 30% of my annual payout because it's a return on my basis. Love it. Uh, and then, you know, I can do fixed, fixed annuities on there too. Awesome. If you do this in this approach, I, I kind of use the analogy, the, the Aesop's fable, um, the tortoise and the hare approach to investing. I get a lot of people that I know constantly ask me, what should I be investing in? Oh, you know, uh, this person came up to me and said that she wanted to sell me some land in Phoenix and, and in Nevada. Um, and then I would get a 20% rate of return. Uh, is there any improvements on that property? No. Is the land entitled for single family development? No. Um, then how are you going to get 20% rate of return? Oh, we're going to sell the property. The property is to somebody and we're going to make the money that way. So it doesn't sound like a good deal. And it did. He called me up. He said, Professor Souza, you were right. She invested in the uh, in these uh, in this land. She paid a hundred thousand dollars. It's worth twenty five grand. We don't know what to do. Okay. You were right when you told us um, not to trust these people. Okay, got it. Okay, so the last one. What time is it? Five sixteen. Five sixteen. Oh, we're we're pretty much on time. Yeah. Um, we'll get on a little bit. Um, Okay, so now that you've you got your career in place, you're accumulating, Aesop's stable, who won the race? Tortoise, tortoise. 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 The hare, I want a 20 to 40 percent rate of return on the stock market. I'm investing everything. I want to make money. Okay, the tortoise, you know what? I'm just going to put a thousand bucks a month, you know, into a bunch of these things. I'm going to get all this stuff set up. And I'm going to kind of plod along. You know, until I get retirement, and boom, I'm going to have basically four to five million bucks in my account. Okay. So probability of losing everything, or a probability of having four to five million in your account. Maybe it's not 50 million, maybe it's four to five million. Five million bucks, you can live very comfortably in retirement, okay, and not worry about anything. And if you invest more, you're probably going to have maybe eight to ten million, you know, accumulate. The money is not for you from some kind of egotistical standpoint. It's basically to take care of your family, you know, and your kids and your, and your grandkids. That's why you deal with it. Uh, okay. So here's, now we're going to move over into the, this was the investment side. Now we're going to start talking about tax and trust stuff, okay? Because you've got to understand this stuff, too. And everybody always says the same thing. But why didn't they teach me this in high school? And why isn't there, you know, personal financial planning class, you know, or something in the finance, you know, curriculum and stuff like that, because they don't care. It's all corporate finance. You know, I, I'm doing this because I was, I've been a wealth manager since 2003. So, 
you're going to accumulate assets. You're going to have two types of assets. You're going to have partnership assets, business or real estate partnerships. Okay, so you don't own the property or the businesses free and clear. You partnered with people. Okay, then you're going to have other assets, real estate, stocks, maybe companies that you wholly own. Okay, so you have these assets over here, basically. Uh, that are fractionalized asset interests, okay? Um, and then you're going to have your wholly owned assets. Okay? Now, your wholly, wholly owned assets is easy. At some point in time, you're going to put them into an irrevocable trust. Well, why would I do that? Well, because if you pass away, the assets are going to go to your heirs at a stepped-up basis, and they're not going to pay any taxes, okay? So that's why you do it, okay? Because taxes are totally evil. So this stuff we can, I can totally handle, although there might be some debt on this because I leveraged up the company or I leveraged up the real estate. So I'm, I may be able to circumvent the taxes, but I'm not going to be able to circumvent uh, the debt. So I still have the debt issue. Is that, is that right? Yeah. Okay. So that's that. But here, this is, this is the stuff I'm concerned about. So I got, you know, I got some business investments and I got some real estate investments with Joey and John and Tina and Lee and Liz. This is a problem, okay? Because if I pass away, right, it's going to trigger taxation and it could actually trigger the debt on it. Now, when you leave stuff like this to the kids, do you think the kids have the money to pay the taxes and the debt liability that's being called on some of this stuff? No. No. So what are they going to do? Yeah, but it's in an illiquid market. So do you think they're going to get base value for it? No, they're probably going to have to sell it at, sell it at a discount. <coughs> what if they sell it at a discount and there's not enough money to pay the debt and the taxes? You just left your kids a liability. Okay? You didn't do anything for them. You actually made them worse off. So what's the solution? Well. You set up the irrevocable trust. <clears throat> that way you don't have to worry about the taxes, but you got the debt issue. Over here, <clears throat> you got debt and tax issues. But you still need to put these, these assets in a living trust. Okay? Because the living trust circumvents probate. So that it'll distribute to the heirs. <clears throat> and won't have to go through the tax system. Okay, solve that problem. But what about the debt and the taxes? Well, this is what you do. And Professor Sousa, I don't believe in life insurance. Okay, tell that to the rich people on the East Coast that invented all this stuff. Because <coughs> they were the ones who went to Congress and lobbied them, and Congress basically passed the legislation to give them the tax preferential treatment, treatments that you know nothing about. <clears throat> okay. So what's the solution? The solution is you take some of the money that's being generated from the assets, and if you're young enough and healthy enough, smart enough, you basically work with some attorneys and some New York life insurance or company or whatever in their advanced planning group, <clears throat> and you basically set up an irrevocable life insurance trust. And you basically do an actuarial projection of what your tax and your debt liability is going to be in the future. And you basically skim off some of the income that you would otherwise receive, and you use that to pay the premium on the life insurance policy. Now, if your tax liability and your debt liabilities match the death benefit um, from the insurance policy. When you die, the insurance policy triggers the death benefit pays to the trust, the trust extinguishes the taxes, extinguishes the debt, and the whole kit and caboodle goes to you guys, uh, tax-free and debt-free. Bam. Is that freaking awesome? It's totally freaking awesome. I wish my dad did that for me. Yeah, he didn't do any of that stuff. He left me a $40,000 barbell. It was brutal. Brutal. Yeah, it was awful. I was so pissed at him. Okay, but that's beside the point. Uh, the next is, I don't know about you, but I love taxes. Okay? 
love them. I love sales taxes. I love transfer taxes. I love Obamacare taxes. I love recapture taxes. I love capital gains. I love state and federal local taxes. I love taxes. Love it. Love to pay them. Love to, just love to pay taxes. I love it. You guys are going to get totally housed. We're getting already totally housed. They're out to gut. They're gunning for us. Right? They're going to get, they're going to get our money. Some way or another, they're going to get it. Unless you're really super smart and set all this stuff up. And the first thing you need to do, first thing you guys need to do, is you need to set up a will. Okay? You can go to LegalZoom.com, set up a will. If you have assets, that's great. If you don't, get a will with a medical directive in it. Okay? I just did this the other day with my wife. So if I get in a car accident or I have a stroke, and I can't work, or there's an opportunity to pull the plug on me, pull the plug. Because I don't want to be living, you know, in a home, you know, totally burning through all of my family's wealth to make them worse, worse off to keep me alive for no reason. Pull the freaking plug and get it done. Save yourself, save the family. So that's really important. Um, the other is you need to get the living trust. Okay, we already talked about that. Uh, an irrevocable trust. We already talked about that. These, these right here, the dynasty trust and the generation skipping trust, you guys are going to love these. Okay? These are my favorite. Okay, Because this is the way it's going to work. Saturday morning, you're sitting around Ginny and Johnny, you know, at the breakfast table having the waffles, and the phone's going to ring. Ring! <clears throat> you pick up the phone. Hello? It's like, oh, mom, how are you? Hi, uh, yeah, so great to hear from you and dad. Uh, yes, I love you too. Oh, Ginny and Johnny are doing great. Uh, you have some news for us? What's the news? What? You did what? Yes, honey, we set up for Ginny and Johnny a dynasty and a generation skipping trust. So basically all of our inheritance that otherwise would go to you are going to them because you guys are so successful and you don't need so, yeah, that's a good one. And then you have charitable remainder trusts. These are kind of cool trusts, too, where you can contribute your assets into a charitable remainder trust and basically pull the money out pretty much tax-free because the assets are going to go to the charity upon death. So that's a pretty good one, too. The rich, rich guys totally understand that one. And then there's intentionally de defective trusts and other types of trust structures that you use depending on the type of what you're trying to do, what your goals and objectives are. So you can engineer pretty much the solution using the insurance, the financial products, you know, the tax structures, the trust structures, the trust, trust and tax stuff. You can totally engineer that stuff. And it is engineering because it's really complex. But if you if you do all that stuff, your asset protected, you're gonna transfer, you're gonna pull out, you're gonna, it's gonna be tax efficient, tax, it's gonna be asset protected. Uh, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna be great. You're gonna be great. If you don't, then you know, God help you, because they're gunning, they're gonna, they're gunning for us. So that's all I got for you guys. It was a great class. Thank you very much. Happy you guys. Um, let me know if there's anything I can do for you guys. You know, letters of recommendation, references. You know, I'm a really loyal person, you know, like an old dog, right? You know, you can, you can kick me and starve me and throw me outside of the rain, shivering, but I'll be there the next morning, you know, loyal. I will be there for you forever if you want me to, to be a part of your life. Just let me know. Thank you. Thank you, dog. You're welcome. And, uh, and take some... Um, <laughs> Take some cheesecake. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much. You're welcome.